This program is made possible by the members of the Church Street Baptist Church in Greensboro, North Carolina. I fail him every day, but there's never been a day, honey, when he failed me and he left me. I walked away from him, but he never walked away from me. Every time I tried to go right, honey, that shepherd hook of love would pull me back. Every time I tried to go left, I felt a long arm of love come in after my soul. He's the one that helped you. He's the one that pulled you out. Some of you didn't have anywhere to go. Some of you didn't have anywhere to worship. Some of you couldn't feel it. And God gave you a house where the glory was. I tell you, make it about Jesus. Keep it about Jesus. We're, we're rowing a hard road. We're going down a hard road. We've just got to keep plowing. We've just got to keep going. We don't need to change the message. We don't need to change the songs. We need to keep talking and teaching and telling and loving and worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ. It's all about Him. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart. To fear and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. And let me set the scene for you tonight. Here in this chapter, Israel and Jerusalem are getting ready to be destroyed. Nebuchadnezzar has brought his army from Babylon, and they have encircled the city of Jerusalem. They have encamped around the walls, and they have been encamped around the walls 18 months. 18 months, they do not let anyone in, and they do not let anyone out. For 18 months, they do not let food in, they do not let food out. For 18 months, they do not let produce, and they do not let products in, and they do not let products out. And it got so bad in Jerusalem that Josephus, the historian, tells us that at some point, that mothers would, would butcher and eat their own children because they were so hungry. That the way that they would cook their children would be to rip down the, the, the wooden walls of their house, take the plaster and the mortar off the wood walls of their house, and set the wood from their house on fire so that they could have warmth in the night. It got so bad that they were killing their own children so that their children would not be able and would not have to go through what was coming whenever Nebuchadnezzar finally broke down the gate of Jerusalem. It was an absolutely dreadful time. During this time, though, there were two prophets that stood up, two big prophets. One's name was Jeremiah, and the other's name was Ezekiel. What's interesting about it is you've got to understand who they're writing to. Whenever Jeremiah wrote his prophecy, Jeremiah was there in Jerusalem writing to the remnant that was left at Jerusalem. Ezekiel had already been carried off to Babylon and is down by the river Kibar and is writing to those people that had been taken captive. Those Jews that had been ripped out of their homeland and they are there and they are asking questions. This is what they're asking. Number one, why did God do this? Number two, will God ever forgive us? And number three, when will that come to pass? So Ezekiel writes, and this is what he's writing. He is saying, number one, I'm going to tell you why God did this. Number two, I'm going to tell you that God is not done with the Jewish people. And number three, I'm going to tell you when all of this is going to come to pass. Ezekiel 8 begins the section, if you've got a Schofield Bible up above it, it says part 4. It is the new section of the scripture and this is what Jeremiah is answering those people. He is answering those people because this is what they're saying. What we did wasn't that bad. And God is going to show Jeremiah, or Ezekiel rather, that what they did was bad, what they did in the open wasn't bad, it was what they did behind closed doors 
that sent them into captivity. Here is what's interesting. Jeremiah or Ezekiel here tells us in Ezekiel 8, he begins to give a vision. And this is the vision he gives. God takes him, whether in the spirit or in the body, we do not know. We just know that Ezekiel was transported back to Jerusalem. And it was at a time when the temple was still standing. And in Ezekiel chapter number 8, God transports Ezekiel and sets him unseen in the inner court of the temple. And this is what he tells Ezekiel. He said, Ezekiel, do you see that hole in the wall? He said, yes, I do, Lord. And in verse number 7, verse number 8, this is what he tells him. He says, bore out the hole. Dig out the hole in the wall. And I'm going to let you see inside. And I'm going to show you greater abominations. Here is the point, brothers and sisters. With man, you can do things behind closed doors. With God, that which is done in secret shall be known in the public. I promise you, you'll never do anything behind closed doors because there is a God that is watching. Ezekiel bores out the hole and this is what he sees. Where is he looking? Well, he looks first of all into the inner court. That is where the table of showbread was. That is where the altar of incense was. That is where the golden lamp stand was. We call that the holy place. He sees some things in there that I'll show you in a moment. But then all of a sudden, Ezekiel gets a glimpse of the holy of holies. And inside the holy of holies is the ark of the covenant of God. And in that ark of the covenant of God, there's not a lamp in there. There's not a light in there. But the light that is inside of that holy of holies is the fire. The Shekinah glory of God, the presence of the Holy Spirit. We would say it like this. Inside of the Holy of Holies was the glory of God. And Ezekiel sees something. Ezekiel sees God so grieved that he sees the glory lift up off of the Holy of Holies. And Ezekiel sees it go up and leave the house. And he sees it leave the house. And Ezekiel further tells us in chapter 9, 10, and 11 that he sees it go up to the north. And the Bible tells us that he sees it stand upon the mountains at Teman. The mountains of... And nobody cries. Nobody weeps. Nobody's upset that the glory was gone. Why? Here's why. Because they were running business as usual. Can I tell you something? There are a lot of churches today that are operating and the glory has lifted up and gone. Why didn't the high priest go in and see that the glory was gone? We don't know. This is what we know. When the glory left, the destruction began. Can I tell you tonight, brothers and sisters... That the one thing that separated the temple at Jerusalem from any other house in the entire world. It was not the gold. It was not the silver. It was not the showbread. It was not the light. It was the glory of God. May I remind you tonight that the one thing that separates this place is not the fact that it says church on the sign. It's not the fact that we sing sing songs out of a hymn book or we sing choruses. It has nothing to do with any of that. It has nothing to do with the fact that a man will stand up with a book and will preach to you from that book that has nothing to do with it. The one thing that sets this place apart is that the people that meet together have been saturated in the glory of God. Brothers and sisters, I cannot tell you enough. I know that, and this has just saturated my mind over the last six months, but this is what I'm seeing among our young people and among our middle-aged people that we have been so void in this nation of the glory of God for so long. Nobody anymore knows what it's like. We see people anymore get up and shout and get up and praise God. They get so full. I've talked about Rob Edwards before. I've talked about that blood pressure hitting the top of his skull and being like a pressure cooker. It just exploded and glory went everywhere, honey. I mean, if you were around him, it was like a fountain went off. I've been in churches where poor people got up and they were so excited because God gave them bread and I mean, the glory of God just oozed all over them and soaked inside of them. But I'll tell you what's happened. Prosperity moved into this nation and we no longer needed God. 
God and we no longer had to have God and our church has got programs and our church has got lights, our church has got cameras, our church has got TV programs, our church has got uh, orchestrated choirs, our church has got big and high on the hall and what they didn't realize is the glory of God had picked up off of their buildings and picked up off of their people and had gone out the window but we don't pay attention anymore. This is the excuse that we use. It's a different day. People just aren't the same anymore. That is exactly right. People are not the same anymore. They hadn't been dipped down in the power of God. They hadn't been dipped down in the unction of God. They hadn't been dipped down in the power of God. I can hear, I've heard preachers preach. I can hear old preacher Kanoa right now on those tapes and on those CDs and on my iPhone, honey. I'm telling you, they didn't have a lot of money, but he would get up and you could just feel honey dripping off of his face. You could just feel, the only thing that made preacher Kanoa better if he'd have had a beard. Say amen right there. This is what I'm telling you. I'm telling you, those old timers, they may not have had what we had, but they had God. They had the power of God. They had the glory of God. It was like honey that would hit you in the parking lot when you were dry and bare and it was like a fountain of water that gushed out across the asphalt. When you were hungry it was like manna that fell from the sky. When you were broken it was a balm that came across your weary heart. When you needed salvation honey it was old time salvation that dipped you down in something. You've been trying to shake it off for these years but I'm telling you what's bothering me is we've got people in this church. We've got people in this county. We've got people in this city and they've not seen the glory of God. They've seen big buildings and they've seen bright lights and they've seen cameras but they have no idea what happened this morning. They say man those people are crazy. No, 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 no. What happens is that thing starts bubbling up on the inside and we want to make every excuse in the book and can I say something? I'm tired of excuses. I'm tired of excuses. I'm tired of excuses. I'm tired of people saying it's a Pentecostal thing. It's a bat. No, 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 no. It's a Jesus thing and when that glory rises up in your soul honey you won't be able to do anything about it. I've been around before and I mean the goosebumps would hit me from the bottom of my feet to the top of my head and I felt like if I didn't shout or if I didn't cry, if I didn't praise God, I'd be disobedient to God. Have you ever had that inside your soul when you said, God I've got to shout, I've got to praise you, I've got to get in the fountain I've got to shout, I've got to do something I'm not going to make it, I can't survive anymore. Here's what bothers me, we've got people and you are so afraid, you're so afraid, it's what I'm telling you, if you don't get in it If you don't fall in it, honey, there's a glory that will pick up off of these places. And you'll be in dead churches. Our counties are full of dead churches. Our cities are full of dead churches. Our preachers are dead preachers. Our Christians are dead Christians. Our churches have no power. They have no life. They have words. They have sermons. But they don't have the glory of God dripping off of them. I'm telling you what we need again, honey. We need education. I'm all for education. You can have degrees. You need degrees. You ought not say ain't and ain't ain't a word. I know that but if it means having the glory of God I'll throw education out the window and I'll take glory every single time but here's what I'm telling you it has nothing to do with education you can be educated like Adrian Rogers or you can be as educated as old John J. Jasper the black preacher from the 1800's he couldn't spell and he couldn't write but he would get up and they say he'd been dipped down so deep in the glory he came up and he was oozing with honey and he'd get up and he couldn't speak good English but he'd say let me tell you something children. There's a river that's a flowing in my soul. Hey, there's a river that's a flowing out of my heart. Hey, there's a river and all of a sudden, son, they said that river would gush out of him as if it was old faithful. It'd run down that side. It'd come around the back side. It'd drench down that side and before you knew it, sinner and saint alike, they were dripping wet with the fountain that was springing with everlasting water. Here's what I'm telling you tonight. I know the entire country will not get this. I know the entire nation. We are living in a different day. I know that but this is what I'm trying to tell the remnant of Jesus Christ we better get so dipped down so deep and so thick in the power and the unction of God that they see the Shekinah on our life they see the filling of the Holy Ghost on our life there are too many churches that God has picked up and pulled off of and left them alone now here's the question I've got how can Israel the great people of God no longer have God among them. What caused God to leave them? What causes God? Because I'm telling you, it is my hope and my prayer that we build this church in such a way that in 100 years it still stands. But I promise you this, 
the day will come when this church ceases to exist. How do you know, preacher? Find the church at Laodicea. Tell me where the church at Corinth is. Tell me where the mighty church at Ephesus is. They don't exist. Why? Because the glory left them. There will come a generation that the glory and the power and the unction of God leaves. I can't control that generation. But my prayer is like David of old to serve my generation well. And to warn you tonight, I have two little things I'll give you. Number one, let me show you the process of the church's destruction. The process of the church's destruction. There is a five-fold process that will happen. I'm going to give them to you. I'm going to lay them out. And you can find it from the people of Israel's history. How will a church be destroyed? How will a church end up where they no longer exist? Number one, the people will defile the church. I'll tell you what will happen. They will sin. The people will get steeped in sin. They'll get comfortable with sin. They'll live in sin. They'll say, you know what? I don't want to deal with that sin. No, no, no. God's not looking for perfect people. He's looking for people that want to be perfect. God's not looking for righteous people. He's looking for people that know a righteous God and attempt to serve that righteous God. God is not looking for people that don't ever mess up. He's looking for people that don't want to mess up. Up. He's not looking for people that never make a mistake. He's looking for people that, that, that don't want to make any mistakes. You understand the difference between being a sinner and being perfect. You are nowhere on either side if you're a child of God. You're not in this camp anymore and you're not in that camp anymore, but you're closer to that side than you are to that side and you're headed to that side and are looking at that side and before you know it, you're going to get on that side when you cross the river. But here's what happened. The church allows sin in it. The church will allow issues in it. The church will allow things to fester in it and like a cancer a wound a sore you all know that I have that Crohn's disease inside of my intestines and right now in my terminal ileum I have a Crohn's spot and it stays there do you know what it is it is an irritation it is something that stays irritated in my terminal ileum and right now if it gets irritated long enough the doctors tell me that an irritation over time can turn into a cancer and then a cancer can metastasize and turn into a really 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 big problem when an issue or an irritant is not dealt with, it will turn into a cancer and a cancer in the church will metastasize and it will ultimately kill that church and so the people defile. Then what happens? Number two, when the people defile that's when the glory departs. You see, God is a holy God. I cannot express that enough. God's throne is a holy throne. God's words are holy words. God's righteousness is a holy righteousness. God's salvation is a holy salvation. God's thoughts are holy thoughts. God's ways are holy ways. God's truths are holy truths. God's church is to be a holy church. God's people are to be a holy people. God's pews are to be holy pews. God's pulpit is to be a holy pulpit. God's songs are to be holy songs. God's ways, God's everything is holy. And here is the point. God will not dwell where sin abounds. Where people refuse to deal with sin the glory will leave. I promise you, when leadership in the church get in sin, God will leave that place. There are two things that will write Ichabod above a church more than anything. Number one, it's when there is immorality among the leadership that is not dealt with. When there is immorality among the pastors and the deacons that is not dealt with, there will begin to be written Ichabod above the doorframe of that church. Number two, when there are financial issues where the leadership are stealing money, God will forever write Ichabod above the doorpost of that church. And when the leadership fall in sin morally and when they fall in sin financially, that is why and that is where God will write Ichabod above the doorpost of the church. Every old timer I've ever heard will say that. My pastor taught me that. That is why I try to be so careful. That is why I try to be so, and I don't want to make this about me, but I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, you young preachers need to hear me. There is a woman out there that the devil has your name on. You will mess up. You will fall, and you will mess up a people. You will mess up a church. That's why I don't try. I don't counsel alone. I don't call women. That is not something you need to be doing, young men. You need to stay pure, and you need to stay holy. I know we live in 2018. I know we've got text messages. I know we've got Facebook, but I'm telling you, in a day and an hour, we're immorality about. 
pounds and a day and an hour where things and let me just take a step further and get some boldness in my soul I still think I'm still old fashioned fellas I don't think you ought to be going out to eat with a lady at work that is not your wife let me just park my Ford tractor right here and preach for a second ma'am let me just say this if he ain't your husband you ought not be parking yourself at the table if his wife or your husband is not there I know it's a friendly business lunch but friendly business lunch often turn into romantic escapades down yonder at the hotel I may be old fashioned honey but I've got God in my soul right now and we need to get back to those old fashioned ways because grandma and granddaddy all they had was a Ford tractor but they had their integrity and they had their morality and they had their testimony when they went down to the grave I'd rather go down to the grave with my testimony intact and a Ford tractor in my name than to have diamonds and riches and all the pomp and circumstance that this life has I'm telling you church you better watch sin in your life now I can tell that went over like a lead balloon but I didn't get in this thing for a popularity contest and I won't leave for a popularity contest I'm just telling you the truth you better watch it and this whole bowl right here better watch it God will depart here's what happens third after the glory departs the church disperses hear me now when God no longer shows up the people will no longer show up this church better, better get that straight People do not come to this church at 9, 30, 11, or 6 because Tyler's here. They come because they heard God was here. But when the glory departs, the people will disperse. Number four, there's another step that happens. Once the people disperse, the land will be deserted. That's why you ride by buildings and they say for sale. It's one thing to sell a church building because you've got to move and get bigger places. It's another thing to sell the church building because you can't pay the bills anymore. You know why you can't pay the bills anymore? Because the people have left. The, ch- the land will be deserted. Then number five, the building will ultimately be destroyed. That's why today there are bars and hotels and there are condominiums and apartments where houses of worship used to sit. You know why? Because the people got in sin and the glory whew, left that's the process now here's my second little point what causes the glory to depart verse number 7 down through verse number 16 I've written down three things these are my message I want to give them to you and I want to show you what caused God to depart well number one look in verse number 10 the Bible says in verse number 10 so I went in and saw and behold every form of creeping thing and abominable beast and all the idols of the house of Israel Port, the portrayed upon the wall round about. What will cause the glory to depart? Number one, allowing the unclean thing. A second thing, verse number 11 and verse number 12, not only because they allowed all creeping things, but look at what verse number 11 and verse number 12 say. And there stood before them 70 men of the ancients of, of the house of Israel, and in the midst of them stood Jehazaniah, the son of Shaphan, with every man his censer in his hand. And a thick cloud of incense went up. Then said he unto me, Son of man, Hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark? Every man in the chamber of his imagery. For they said, The Lord seeth us not. The Lord hath forsaken the earth. Here is the leadership of the house of Israel. And here is what they're saying. God's not even here anymore. Can I tell you what will bring the glory out of this place quick? Number two, it's atheism among the leadership. Here's the third thing that will leave the glory of God quickly. It's when that church abandons the Lord Jesus Christ. The greatest idolatry a church can commit is when they say, it's no longer all about Jesus. Everything in the church is supposed to tell you about Jesus. Every sermon is supposed to tell you about Jesus. Every song is supposed to tell you about Jesus. Every Sunday school lesson is supposed to tell you about Jesus. Every special is supposed to tell you about Jesus. Every lick on the piano is supposed to tell you about Jesus. Every deacon is supposed to tell you about Jesus. 
Every soundboard is supposed to tell you about Jesus. Every stitch of clothing ought to tell you about Jesus. Why? Because he's the one that died. And he's the one that saved. And he's the one that gives life. And he's the pure one. And he's the holy one. And he's the good one. And he's the matchless one. And he's the sweet one. And he's the good one. And he's the grace-filled one. He's the loving one. He's the one that died on Calvary's hill. He's the one that walked on the water. He's the one that fed the 5,000. He's the one that touched the blind eyes. He's the one that healed the deaf ears. He's the one that healed the withered hands. He's the one that touched those that had nothing. He's the one that healed the woman with the issue of blood. He's the one that found me that day at the back of the Vandalia Baptist Church and saved my soul. He's the one that met you at an old-fashioned altar. He's the one that healed your heart. He's the one that found you where you were, picked you up out of the miry pit of sin, set your feet on the solid rock, gave you life, gave you hope, put your family back together, gave you a spouse when you're spouse walked out on you. Gave you somebody that loved you when your daddy would never tell you that he loved you. Gave you bread on your table when you didn't even have enough potatoes to rub together as a baby. I'm telling you it's all about Jesus. Everything's about Jesus. He's the sweet rose of Sharon. He's the lily of the valley. He's the bright morning star. He's the fairest of 10,000. He's the alpha and the omega. He's the one that's before all and after all. Before him there was nothing and after him there'll be nothing. He's everything and between and a whole lot more. Everything in the church ought to be about Jesus. And I'm telling you this, as long as Jesus is on the forefront, I promise you God will show up every single service. I don't care if you're falling out at his feet to pray or lifting your hands up to worship. I don't care if I preach like a madman or preach like a quiet man. As long as Jesus is high and lifted up, God will show up. And it doesn't matter how you feel when you walk in. If Jesus is lifted up, God will heal your heart. It doesn't matter if I preach Preach on tithing or preach on wearing ties or preach on Calvary. I could preach on the garden. I believe I could preach on pinto beans and the Holy Ghost show up as long as I talk about how Jesus ate pinto beans. I believe it's all about Jesus. I believe he's the high one. I believe he's the holy one. I believe he's the good one. He's the one your kids need to hear about. He's the one our children need to hear about. He's the one the babies in the nursery need to hear about. He's the subject of every song. He's the subject of every sermon. How do I know? I know because he did something in my heart. And I can't get enough of him. I don't, I, don't, I don't do everything right. I fail him every day. But there's never been a day, honey, when he failed me and he left me. I walked away from him, but he never walked away from me. Every time I tried to go right, honey, that shepherd hook of love would pull me back. Every time I tried to go left, I felt a long arm of love coming after my soul. He's the one that helped you. He's the one that pulled you out. Some of you didn't have anywhere to go. Some of you didn't have anywhere to worship. Some of you couldn't feel it. And God gave you a house where the glory he was. I tell you, make it about Jesus. Keep it about Jesus. We're, we're rowing a hard road. We're going down a hard road. We've just got to keep plowing. We've just got to keep going. We don't need to change the message. We don't need to change the songs. We need to keep talking and teaching and telling and loving and worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ. It's all about Him. It's all about Him.